all did this. Yay, success. Good. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to Professor Tollum for inviting me to give this talk. Thanks to Christy for the lovely introduction and to Sarah for all of her help organizing it. Now, I'm going to talk today about an area of mathematics. It's not my area, but it's an area of maths that I thought would be fun to do because it feels like we're playing games and we're solving puzzles. It doesn't feel like we're working. But it turns out that this bit of mathematics has applications over not only lots and lots of maths, but also to the physical sciences, to economics and beyond. So I'm going to do a bit of playing games with you and a bit of talking about applications to bigger problems. OK, so it's, it's the maths of connections. It's about connections between pairs of things. For most of this talk, the things are going to be people, and it will be connections between pairs of people. But later on, we'll see some connections between other things as well. So first connection is friendship. And we have a problem with parties. So here's a question for you. Suppose you were organising a party and you wanted to guarantee that it was going to be a good sort of party where some people knew each other and some people didn't know each other and could get to meet each other. How many people would you need to come to guarantee that at least three of them either all knew each other, so you had a little trio of mutual friends who could huddle in the corner and discuss past matters, or at least three of them didn't know each other, so you could have a little trio of people who could all meet each other for the first time and get to know one another. Let's see. So, let's do an experiment with the audience here. I'm going to pick some of you. Uh, obviously, most people in this room aren't going to know each other. That would be a slightly boring experiment. So, I'm going to pick some people that are sitting near each other so we have at least a chance of some knowings. Maybe in a pink top, what's your name? Elska. Elska. E L S K A? E L S K E. E L S K E. Okay. So, there's my first person, Elska. And then the gentleman next to her, Stefan. Stefan. Like that? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. And then let's go one further along, the lady in the black. Christine. Christine. And then let's take behind the gentleman in the black jacket. Richard. Richard. And next to him, the Heather. Heather. And the other side of Heather in green. Amanda. Okay, now, some of you, I suspect, know each other, or at least you're sitting next to each other, so you've now met, um, and some of you probably don't. I'm going to go around and ask each of you whether you know each other or not. If you do know each other, we'll draw a red line between you, and if you don't know each other, we'll draw a green line between you. So first of all, Elska and Stefan, do you know each other? Yes, you do, so you get a red line between you. Elska, do you know Christine? Yes. yes. Another red line. Do you know Richard? Nope. Directly behind you? No, so that's going to be a blue line. Or Heather next to him? No. Or Amanda, which has somehow come out Amanda. Over here. <laughs> OK, now I don't need to ask quite so many questions carrying on around. Stefan, who do you know of this lot? Uh, Eska and Christine. Right. But not Richard, nor Heather, nor Amanda. Christine, who do you know of this lot? Eska and Stefan, and I don't know Richard. Okay, so we can put a blue line there. Richard, do you know Heather? Yes. Yes. Do you know Amanda? No. No. So we have that. And Amanda and Heather, do you and Amanda know each other? No, you don't. You're just sitting next to each other. You should say hello. I'm sure it'd be nice. <laughs> okay, so in this experiment, we can see not only have we got a red triangle, so we found three people that all knew each other. Oh, the wrong yeah, we do. Amanda and Heather don't know each other. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Not only have we got a red triangle, three people that all know each other, namely the three that were sat together in the front row, Elska, Stefan and Christine, but we also have quite a lot of blue triangles. For example, Amanda, Elska and Richard don't all know each other. So with this little experiment with six people, it did indeed work. There's a bit of a clue that that was already written on my slide. Um, now, obviously, in maths, an experiment is not a proof. We've shown that maybe six people is enough. With this group of six people, it works. But we're interested in finding the smallest possible number. So what can we say in general? Well, we're going to need to model this. So we're going to model this with what's called graph theory. This isn't graphs in the sense of x-axis and y-axis. I'll tell you what it is. There's only about three new words in this talk. Graphs is one of them. So we'll represent the people as dots. So imagine that each of those names it's just a dot. Now, we could have the name there as well, so we know who we're talking about. But just dots. 
Those dots are called vertices. There's one new word I need you to remember. I'm not going to talk about dots, I'm going to talk about vertices. If two people knew each other, what did we do? We drew a red line between them. And I'm going to call the lines edges. So it's a new word, edge, but it just means a line going between two dots. That's all it is. And if they didn't know each other, we drew a blue line between them. And that's called a blue edge. And the overall thing of vertices and edges is called a graph. So there's three words, dots and edges, vertices and edges, is a graph. We want to find the smallest possible number of vertices. So the smallest number of people we could invite to our party, such that however we coloured the edges, whether they knew each other or didn't know each other, we'll always be guaranteed to find either a red or a blue triangle. Or as happened here, we found both. That's also fine. So mathematical either or includes both. Well, here's a picture. There's a graph. I've got five vertices there. And I've drawn in edges between all of the pairs of vertices. And I've coloured some of them red and some of them blue. Now, in that graph, there's no triangle. So I want to emphasise that doesn't count as a triangle because it's not between vertices. A triangle would have to be three vertices with edges between them coloured. So in this graph, I've got five blue edges around the outside. They definitely don't form a triangle at all. And I've got five red edges forming a star in the middle. They don't form any triangles either. So this is a proof that five is not enough. Okay, if I had a really rubbish party and only invited five people, it would be possible that no trio of people either all knew each other or all didn't know each other, if they happened to know each other like that. If one of them were me, I would hope that I knew more people at my own party, but it's conceivable. Okay. Well, I'm going to show you now that six is always enough. There was a giveaway with that on my slide, obviously. Um, so let's see a proof. We're going to use a proof using a mathematical principle, which makes it sound terribly fancy, but it's really not. It's about pigeons and holes. So let's imagine we've got some pigeons, a whole bunch of them cooing away. I need a number for the number of pigeons, so we'll call it P for pigeon. P pigeons. And suppose I've got a bunch of holes. I don't know, maybe nice pigeon boxes. That's nicer than holes in the ground, isn't it? We're going to put the pigeons in boxes. Uh, and I need some number for the holes, so let's suppose I have H holes. Nice and memorable. And let S be whatever you get when you divide P by H. Now, that might be a fraction, in which case, for reasons we'll see later, I'm going to want you to round up. Uh, or it might not be. And I've called it S because it's going to be the squash factor. You'll see why in a second. Well, the pigeonhole principle sounds like a grand principle, but what it says is if we take all of our P pigeons, we put them in holes, cooing as they go, right? So we're putting them into holes. Then at least one of the holes is going to contain at least S squashed pigeons. Round up. I don't want half a pigeon going in this hole. <laughs> For example, if I had two holes and I was putting five pigeons into them, we'd work out that five over two was two and a half, so we round up three. So at least one of these holes would have to contain at least three pigeons, no matter how I put my five pigeons in the hole. It might be I put all five in the same hole. That's fine. That's at least three. But at least one hole contains at least S squashed pigeons. All right. What have pigeons and parties got to do with each other? Well, let's imagine we're going to try and prove that whenever I have six people at a party, I can find three of them that all know each other or three of them that all don't know each other. So here's six people at a party, and let's suppose that one of them is me. So I'm hosting a party. We need to show that I can always find a red triangle or a green triangle, no matter how I colour it. Well, let's associate the other five people at my party with being pigeons. Maybe I'm having a party for pigeons, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> so the pigeons are going to be these other five vertices here. And we're going to put those pigeons into two holes. There's going to be one hole for the pigeons that know me, and one hole for the pigeons that don't know. Sorry, that sounds completely ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, we'll put the pigeons into some holes. So we've got five pigeons and two holes. So as we just saw, that means that at least one hole contains at least three pigeons. It's not possible for each hole only to have two in, because then I'd only have four pigeons to play with, and I'm playing with five pigeons. So let's imagine, for the sake of argument, that three pigeons know me. We might as well assume it's those three, because there's nothing distinguishing them. I'm not saying anything about the remaining pigeons. I don't know whether they know me or not. They might. We're just not filling in an edge there. OK, well, let's think about whether those pigeons know each other. If those two pigeons know each other, then we've got a red triangle. So that's definitely going to be enough. If those two pigeons know each other, then we've got a red triangle. So that's enough. And similarly, if those two know each other, 
So we've got a red triangle. So the only way we could fail to have a red triangle is if all three of them didn't know each other. And at that point, we would have a blue triangle. So that's a proof that no matter how these people know each other or don't know each other, I'm definitely going to find either a red or a blue triangle. Now, we haven't considered the case where at least three people don't know me, but I'm sure you could imagine we would have done exactly the same argument with the colours reversed. So that's a proof that six people at a party, you can always find at least three who know or three who don't. OK. Six people at a party is a bit boring. We want more people at our parties. We want more people to be friends. So let's consider what happens with more people. We've seen that if we want three mutual friends or three mutual strangers, we need six. Now, there's some notation for this. We write it R of three is six. So R is a function. It has as input the number of people I want to be friends or strangers, in this case, three. And it outputs the number of people I need at my party. So that's six. What about four? What about wanting four people to all know each other or all not know each other? Well, it's not too hard to show. I teach my undergrads it. It takes about half an hour. But if you want four people to all know each other or not know each other, then you need 18 people at your party. That's getting to be a more sensible size party. Uh, what can we say about bigger things? Well, the reason I'm writing this R of whatever is whatever, they've got to name these numbers. They're called the Ramsey numbers. So the input N is the number of people you all want to know each other or not know each other. And the output is the number you need to invite to your party. They're called Ramsey numbers after this chap here, Frank Ramsey. Now, he was born in Cambridge. He's buried in Cambridge. Um, he died at the age of 26. He died horribly young. Um, he came from a very intellectual, well-known family. He himself was an, was an atheist, but his brother went on to be Archbishop of Canterbury, so there must have been some interesting dinner table conversations in that house. Um, and he was interested in the foundations of mathematics. So maths and philosophy. What are the numbers? Can we reasonably found addition? What, what does it mean to say that 2 plus 2 is 4? So he was working, you may have heard of the work of Russell and Whitehead, he was around at the same time. Don't worry if you don't know what that is. Now, there's a quote about Frank Ramsey, which is that his enduring fame rests on a theorem he didn't need, proved in the course of trying to do something we now know can't be done. <laughs> so what he was trying to do was find methods for deducing that logical statements are consistent with one another. We now know, thanks to the work of Gödel and others, that this is an unsolvable problem. It's something that can't be done. There's a whole lecture in that in itself. I'm not going to go there. But what did he prove that's relevant to us? He proved that the Ramsey numbers are finite for all n. So no matter how many people I want to know each other or not know each other, there is some party that's big enough that I can guarantee that that will happen. So if they're finite for all n, as mathematicians, our question is, well, what are they? How big are they? What about R of 5? I've just told you I can do R of 14 with my undergrads in about half an hour. Turns out that's quite hard. So here's another very famous mathematician, Paul Erdos, a Hungarian. He's been described as possibly the greatest problem solver of all time. He wrote over 1,500 papers in his lifetime. And thanks to ongoing collaborations, he's still publishing now. Um, so he worked on this problem. And he was able to prove lower bounds and upper bounds, some of which have been improved since. So the best we can say about R of 5 is that it's somewhere between 43 and 49. So it might be that if we have 43 people at a party, we're guaranteed that five of them all know each other or don't. But it might not be enough. You might need to go higher than that. You might need to go as high as 49 before you can find five people that all know each other or don't know each other. R of 6 is even worse. So we know that 102 people might be enough if you want six people to all know each other or not know each other. But it might not be. You might need to go as far as 165. So an awful lot of people have worked on this problem. It's been conjectured for about 15 years now that that 43 is correct. But it's such a big problem that we don't know how to solve it. Erdos himself said that if a fleet of highly intelligent aliens arrived at the Earth and threatened to destroy us, if we couldn't give them the value of R of 5, we would throw every single mathematician and computer in the world into solving that problem. Hopefully, we would be able to answer it in time. If, however, the fleet of highly intelligent aliens arrived at the Earth and wanted to know the value of R of 6, we would just have to try and destroy them, even though we would certainly lose, because we have no hope of working out what R of 6 is. <laughs> so here's some things about finite numbers. We're mathematicians. We like to generalize. Let's imagine an infinite party. That's got to be fun. 
So, infinite in the sense of the counting numbers. As many as there are whole numbers, it goes on and on and on forever. You just keep letting people into the house. There's an infinite Ramsey theorem. So that says that given infinitely many vertices, okay, infinitely, infinitely many, just keep on drawing them, keep on drawing your dots. However you draw the lines, you can always find infinitely many connected all with red edges or all with blue edges. That doesn't mean all of them, right? Infinity is a slippery beast. So it might mean, suppose I associated um, each of my vertices with a whole number, one, two, three, four, five. It might mean, say, that all the even ones were connected with red edges, but I'm not saying anything about the odd ones. It's not all of them, but it is infinitely many. Okay, I said this bit of math had some unexpected applications, so let me just sketch out an unexpected application. This is an application in number theory. So a prime number is a number that's divisible only by itself and 1. So, for example, 7 is prime, because the only dividers of 7 are 1 and 7. So that's all you find. 4 is not prime, because 2 divides this as well. That's what a prime number is. Every positive number factorizes in essentially only one way into prime numbers. So, for example, 12 divides up into 2, 2, and 3. 2 is prime, it's only divisible by 1 in itself. 3 is prime, it's only divisible by 1 in itself. And whilst you can write the 2, the 2, and the 3 in various different orders, you're always going to find two 2s and a 3. There's no other way of doing it. Okay, well, here's a consequence of my infinite Ramsey theorem. There exists an infinite set of positive whole numbers, so the numbers you're all used to, the counting numbers, such that whenever I pick two numbers in S, any two at all, the sum, n plus n, add them together, has an even number of prime factors where I include multiplicity. So that's an odd number of prime factors there. One, two, three, because we're including multiplicity. But whenever I do this sum, I find an even number of prime factors. Now, how's that going to work? It's actually very easy to prove that it's coming out from the Ramsey theory. So let me just give you an example of what this graph is going to look like. For example... I might have two of my numbers being 5 and 7. If two numbers have an odd number of prime factors, sorry, I'm losing chalk here, then I'm going to draw a blue line between them once we've added them together. So we know that 5 plus 7 is 12, and I've written up there, 12 is 2 times 2 times 3. So that's an odd number, 2 times 2 times 3. If two numbers have an even number of prime divisors in their sum, then I'm going to draw a red line between them. So, for example, 2 and 4 are going to have a red line between them because 6, which is their sum, is 2 times 3, and that's an even number of factors I've written down. So, once I've constructed this graph, it's going to take me an infinite amount of time, but sometimes we can do hard work. Once I've constructed this graph... Ramsey's theorem says that either we're going to find infinitely many connected with red edges, which would mean that all of the sums had an even number of prime factors, or we're going to find infinitely many connected with blue edges, which means they have an odd number of prime factors, always. Well, infinitely many red edges, fine. That means we've found our set S. It's the infinitely many numbers that are all connected with red edges, because that means every single sum has an even number of prime factors. But then it looks like we're stuffed, because Ramsey's theorem doesn't promise us that. It says that maybe we find infinitely many all connected with blue edges. It means I find infinitely many with an odd number of prime factors in their sum. That's not very good. What are we going to do? Well, look at my 5 and 7 over there. They're connected with a blue edge. I'm going to consider what happens when we double them. So if I double 5, I'm going to get 10. <laughs> if we double 7, I'm going to get 14. And then, of course, 10 plus 14 is 24. So here I've got 24, which is twice 12, because I doubled each end. So I'm going to get 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. So I started out with a blue edge and infinitely many with blue edges. But if I look at what happens when we've doubled every single one of those edges... I must, in fact, have also got infinitely many connected together 
all with red edges. So if we have infinitely many blues coming out of the infinite Ramsey theorem, we double them and conclude that we must also have infinitely many reds. I think this is an unsolved problem, but consider it a challenge. The thing about Ramsey's theorem is it doesn't tell you how to find these sets. It just says they exist. So there's another quote from Paul Oidos from my previous slide. He worked on the infinite Ramsey theorem and some consequences. This was a proper, you may know Einstein's quote about God playing dice with the universe to do with quantum physics. Well, Erdos's quote was, uh, God may not, do, not, may not play dice with the universe, but something very strange is going on with the primes. So here we have a strange thing with primes. All right, that's enough on friendship. Let's move on through. Let's get married. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the maths of marriage. Ah, uh, okay, here's a theorem on marriage. I thought this the theorem on a slide was a bit boring. You get a cartoon as well. Um, here's a theorem due to a gentleman called Philip Hall. He was a son of a king. There he is. He's most famous to me as one of the founding fathers of British group theory. He was actually, fortunately for us, a failed civil servant. He failed his civil service entrance exams and so came back and was a fellow in Cambridge and proved this theorem. So suppose we've got some women, N of them. I'm going to give them names. They're going to be called woman 1 through to woman N. I'm going to write them W1 up to WN. And let's imagine that each woman has some list of the men that she will happily marry. Not in ranked order, just a list of names somewhere. These are the people she's happy to marry. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, that each man will happily marry any woman who will have him. So <laughs> we don't need to worry about their preferences at all. And now the question is, are we going to be able to marry off these women so that they're happy? Philip Hall proved that if every woman can be happily married, if and only if, so we require this condition and it's also sufficient, right? We, we need it to be true, and if it's true, it works. If whenever we pick some of the women, so I've called it curly W, it's a set of women, the union of their lists of men, so I get their list from each of them and then make a big list which is all of them put together, the number of men on that list is at least as big as the number of women whose lists I've got. Now, it's completely obvious that I need that to be true. If I can find four women that between them only want to marry three men, then it's clear that I can't happily marry those four women off. What's more surprising is that that's actually enough. Um, I'm not going to go into the proof of this theorem. Again, it's not that hard, but uh, it would take up too much of my talk. But it's enough that whenever I look at their lists of men, I find at least as many men as I've got women. That may be a bit too much for you to absorb in one go, so I'm going to show you an application of it. Sudoku. I said this was the maths of puzzles. So I have a bit of a bone to pick with the independent. Here's their Sudoku instructions. There's no mathematics involved in solving Sudoku, apparently. Use logic and reasoning to solve the problem. Now, I would argue that any puzzle that you need to use logic and reasoning to solve is squarely in the domain of mathematics. But anyway, here we go. So here's a partially completed Sudoku problem from the independent. Let me remind you how it works. It's going to have each cell in the end filled with the numbers 1 through 9. And the rules are that each number must appear exactly once in each row, exactly once in each column, and exactly once in each subsquare. So you sit there bored on a train, and then you fill in the numbers and feel a sense of aching uh, uselessness when you finally finish. <laughs> but anyway, just to completely get clear, let's think about this row here. So the one with 8, 3, 1, and 6 in it. It must have a 2 in it somewhere, because every number appears exactly once with, within each row. Now, could a 2 appear in either of these two cells? Nope, because there's 2 there. Oh, you're quick. <laughs> could a 2 appear in this cell? Nope, because there's a 2 in the column. So the 2 must be in one of these two, so it's there. All right? So that's the way we reason our way through Sudoku. All right. We're going to consider this bottom left subsquare that's just blown up in red. And I'm going to show you how we can view this as a marriage problem. One marriage problem for each subsquare. The women who want to get married are the unfilled cells. So I'm counting down from the top. So that's 7, 1, 7, 2, 7, 3, 8, 1, and 9, 3. The men are the spare numbers. So there's some numbers already appearing in that cell, 1, 2, 3, and 5. 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are not currently in that cell, so they're going to be our men. So we'll draw a graph. There's my women, all lined up in a row. 
one vertex for each of them. There's the men. So the numbers we had available for us were four, six, seven, eight, and nine. We're going to put an edge from a woman to a man if she's not got that number in her row or column at the moment, so she could marry him. The men she's willing to marry are the men that don't currently appear in her row or column. So if we look at lady number seven, one there, she's got a one and a two in her column, but they're not available anyway. She's got a seven or eight in her row, so she can't marry those two men, but she can marry the other three. All right, at the moment, that's what we know. She could be four, six, or nine. Similarly, the lady next to her, seven, two, there's one, three, two in the column, but they're not available anyway, seven, eight in the row, so she also can marry four, six, and nine. And the same thing for woman seven, three, four, six, and nine. Woman eight, one down here has a lot of freedom to play with. So <laughs> she can't marry one, two, or five. None of them are there, so she gets connected to everybody. Similarly, woman nine, three has a fair bit of choice. She can't marry man eight, but everybody else is fair game. So we have a graph. Now this graph currently looks like an unholy mess. How is this possibly going to help us solve? Well, there's a concept in Hall's marriage theorem called a critical set of women. This is not that they are the especially choosy ones. It's that when I've looked at their lists of men, I find that they're willing to marry exactly the right number of men and no more. So you probably saw when I was drawing this up, we're not going to focus on the men. There's some critical sets from their side. We're only caring about the women's opinions at this point. Um, but as I was drawing them up, maybe you noticed that there was a set of three women, namely 7, 1, 7, 2, and 7, 3, that all are connected only to 4, 6, or 9. So we're going to use that critical set of women. All of the edges coming out of them go to 4, 6, and 9. Now, if we're going to happily marry those women, they must be married to 4, 6, and 9. 8, 1, and 9, 3 can't have them. It's going to be chaos at that point. People are going to be fighting. So let's delete all the edges from 8, 1, and 9, 3 to 4, 6, and 9, because we know that's not going to work. So just get rid of them. And that's what we wind up with left. Now we look again and try and find a critical set of women. And at this point, we notice that woman 9, 3 now only has one edge coming out. There's only one man that she's now willing to marry. Once we've removed the ones that 7, 1, 7, 2, and 7, 3 have had their eyes on for a while. So we put the 7 in that cell. That's definitely going to happen. And now we know that woman 8, 1 can't marry man 7. So again, we look. There's now only one edge coming out of woman 8, 1. She must marry man number 8. And so we can put that in. That's all the information we're going to get out of this problem right now. We then would have to go on to one of the other subcells and set up a similar marriage problem and do some more deductions and come back to this one later. It is possible to set up Sudokus that can't be solved like this, but we're yet to find a newspaper one, say, that can't be. So if you feel like having a go on the train home or whatever, um, pick a cell and start working out who can marry who. All right. Oh, and I should mention, I nixed this idea from Peter Cameron, who was mentioned in my introduction, so uh, thanks to him. All right. Let's think about longer distance connections. So, so far, we've only thought about edges between vertices, whether they're there, whether they're not there, whether they're red, whether they're blue. We've not thought about anything further away. Kevin Bacon game. Some of you are going to hear for heard of the Kevin Bacon game. So, the rule with the Kevin Bacon game, it's a pub game that got almost completely killed by the availability of smartphones. But anyway, somebody would posit an actor, Hollywood actor. You want to find the shortest path to them from Kevin Bacon. What does a path from them to Kevin Bacon look like? You have to think of films they've been in and the actors that have been in those films. So if two people have been in a film together, you can move from them from the first one to the second one. And you want to see how many actors you have to go through until you find yourself inexorably drawn to the force that is Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so we're in the modern era. We're going to use films in the internet movie database. That provides a very strict set of rules as to who's connected and who's not connected. So you need to find pairs of actors that have been together in the internet movie database. And the minimum number of um, films you have to go through to get to Bacon is known as the actor's Bacon number. You can look this up on Wikipedia. So here is an eminent Cambridge graduate and a former rector of the University of St Andrews, John Cleave. Just to show you how this works, he was in a film known as The Big Picture with Kevin Bacon. So that means that John Cleese's Bacon number is one. 
okay? He's been directly in one film with Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon's Bacon number is naught, because he is Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so we're going to model this as a graph, because everything in this talk is being modeled by graph. So the vertices are going to be every single actor in the IMDb. There's a lot of them. Cut two million. The edges are going to be between actors who've appeared in a film together. And then what we're interested in is the Bacon number, which is the number of edges in the shortest path from the actor you started with to Kevin Bacon. So let's see some examples. Uh, oh, well, I should say, it's infinity if no path exists. However, there's a conjecture that, well, it, it's, there's a website called the Oracle of Bacon where you can look these things up. And uh, there, there, there is no actor who's ever appeared in a Hollywood movie that doesn't have a finite Bacon number. The biggest one is nine. Okay. Let's see some, because right, he's, he's not crazy famous, but then you see his face and you're like, oh, it's that guy, because he's in everything. So, yeah. All right, let's see some more examples. Can anyone name this fine, strapping young fellow for me? Marlon Brando, well done from back there. So, yes, Marlon Brando was in a film called Candy in 1968 with Ringo Starr. Very good. Uh, who's going to be this year in a film with the fantastic title Scum Rocks. It's not out yet with Kevin Bacon, in which, pleasingly, Kevin Bacon plays Kevin Bacon. So, <laughs> so this proves that Marlon Brando has a Bacon number of at most two. We had to go through two films. Um, in fact, his, his Bacon number is exactly to, if you believe, the Bacon game. All right, let's get more mathematical. Paul Erdos, you've seen a picture of him already. He's famous for having lots and lots of collaborators. Well, mathematicians play a similar game, a bit less glam, we're not Hollywood actors. So our game is that the Erdos graph has as vertices everyone who's ever published an academic paper. Two people have an edge between them if they've published a paper together. We do lots of working together, working in the coffee shop and working in the pub is a fun thing to do, so we publish lots of joint papers. So here's an example. Here's my former PhD student, Nina Menezes. She's just finished. During her PhD, she published a paper with me. You didn't need a picture of me. I have published a paper with the lovely Max Neunhurser, who's in the office next to me. This is him on the beach at Fraser Island in Australia. He has published a paper with the eminent Hungarian mathematician, Arkos Szeres, who sadly died just recently. And Arkos, in his youth, published a paper with Paul Erdos. So that's a proof that Nina's Bacon Erdos number is at most one, two, three, four. In fact, I'm sure it's exactly four because I'm very sure about my own Erdos number. Um, so we could, this is the counting game. It's just like the baking game, but it's with papers. We can put them together. <laughs> your Erdos number, if you have one, added to your bacon number, if you have one, is your Erdos bacon number. <laughs> Most people's Erdos bacon number is infinity. There's not very many people who have both published an academic paper and appears in a Hollywood movie. <laughs> However, there are some. There's someone with an Erdos Bacon number of six. Anyone you know who that? Natalie Portman, indeed. Has an Erdos number of five because she published a paper while she was a student at Princeton and a Bacon number of one. So these things are doable. <laughs> All right, it's about to get gloomier. We've had glamour. We've had friendship. We've had marriage. We're going to get sick now. Section <laughs> three is disease. So, much calmer. Right? It's not Hollywood anymore. You're a farmer. <coughs> You're a farmer who plants orchards. You grow apples. Now, by and large, the growing of apples is not the most stressful of existences. Your trees are there. They grow apples once a year. You pick the apples. You probably have to treat the trees a bit. But there is one thing that causes a real problem, and that's blight. So if your trees get blight, the apples are going to be unsellable. They're not very nice. Now, the thing with blight is it's a tree disease carried by birds and insects, so it can arrive completely randomly in your orchard. You don't know where it's going to arrive, if it's going to arrive, whether it's going to arrive lots of times or just once, or, but it can get there. Once it's in your orchard, you have a problem, because it can spread from a tree, which I've represented as vertices for ease, to its neighbours, so just up the way, down the way, side to side. If you put more trees into your orchard, if you pack them in a bit tighter, then obviously you're going to get more apples, that's good. However, if you put more trees in, then they're quite close together, and so that means it's more likely that blight is going to spread from one tree to the next. So you've got a trade-off to make. You want lots of trees, you don't want them all to get blight. So, 
very practical real life question. How closely together should you plant these trees? I'm not going to give an actual answer in this talk, but I'm going to hit it with some maths and we'll see what happens. So I ran some experiments. So I'm going to draw some experiments here on a big square grid. Let me tell you what I've done. So this is a grid of, what is it, nine by nine dots, nine by nine vertices. And I'm imagining it as being part of some grid. And I've put in the edges, I've tossed a four-sided magic coin. Uh, and if it came up magic heads, that being one of the four possibilities, then I've put an edge in. And if it didn't, then I've not put an edge in. And this is what happened. This was an actual experiment with P equals a quarter. So what we've seen there is there are some clumps. So there's three trees for the clumps. But one infection in general spreads to at most four other trees. We've not got any clumps bigger than five in there. And we've got an awful lot of trees on their own. So this isn't to say what would actually happen, because we don't know where the blight's going to arrive. But this is giving us some indication of what we might expect if blight arrived in the orchard. Running it again with P equals a half. So now I've tossed a normal coin. And just if it's come up heads, we've put an edge in. And if it's come up tails, we haven't. Quite a mess. So the biggest cluster you might be able to see is this one up here. That's got 36 trees in it. More than half of the trees are in three big clusters. There's another big cluster there, and there's another biggish one snaking its way through here. But we've also got lots of little things. I mean, some around the edge, but that's kind of a boundary phenomenon. We shouldn't put too much emphasis on that. But there's also some, you know, there's a little isolated vertex right in the middle there. So quite a messy picture. By the time we go up to three quarters, I've packed my trees in really quite tightly by that point. One infection, if it arrived, would cover almost the entire orchard. So I definitely should not be packing my trees in so close that a blighty tree has probability three quarters of spreading to another. OK. Let me tell you about percolation theory. So percolation theory is the maths of this kind of problem. There's two ways we can do it. So I've just shown you percolation theory with edges. There's also the possibility of percolation theory through vertices. So what you can imagine there is vertices are all connected up with water pipes, say. So vertices can be open or closed. If they're open, the water can flow through the pipes. If they're closed, it can't. So we're going to make them open with probability P and closed otherwise. So here's a big grid. We first of all choose some vertices that are going to be open. I think I've picked them with probability two thirds, I think. But anyway, I've chosen randomly, got the computers to do it. And then if those are open, then stuff can flow between them. Let me just emphasize, so this is a little isolated vertex there. Although it's open, it can't flow down to that one down there because the vertices between it are blocked. This is a big-ish clump here, but it doesn't link up to these three over here. They're separate. All right, let's do this. You all have slips of paper. So at least the first seven or so rows have slips of paper. In my bag, I have three tennis balls. So instruction one, I'm afraid, is Stand up, all of you. That couple of rows probably, if you don't have a slip of paper, then don't bother standing up because I'm not going to do it. Are you up to standing up? Right, can I get Slady here? Can you please? I've got balls numbered one, two, three in this bag. Can you please pick a ball out of the bag? Okay, we have ball number two. Some of you will now be told to sit down with ball number two. Some of you will have been told to keep standing. Yeah? Everybody got a sense of who's sitting down and who's standing? OK, we're now going to percolate. So I'm going to give the front row people some red cards. Red cards. And some red cards. Now, when the cards reach your row, please pass them on to neighbours that are directly next to you who are standing up, but not to anyone who's sitting down and not through anyone who's sitting down. So just make sure you both have cards. If there's Wait one sec, we'll, do the, we'll percolate backwards shortly. So everybody in the front row got some cards. Some. OK, now, people in the front row, can you please turn around? If the person in the row behind you is standing up, so the person directly behind you, not if they're not, then please pass your cards on to them. Keep one, keep one so we can see that you've had them. But pass all the rest of them on to them. OK, people in row two. Anyone next to you standing up, give them some cards. Just spread them out along. I've got some spares if people feel they don't have enough. OK. And now turn around and please pass the cards on only if there's somebody directly standing up behind you. 
no, that's not directly behind you, only directly behind you. You're going to need some more there. Yeah, yes, yeah, directly behind you. Go some more. So please spread out along this row between the people that are standing up, so you've all got some cards. And then percolate back to the next row. So if somebody behind you is standing up directly behind you, give them all but one of your cards. All right, most of the cards should have made it back to here now. And again, rotate, and if they're standing up, pass them on. If somebody directly behind you is standing up so we can pass them on. All right, we're going to run out of cards fairly shortly. I wasn't sure if we'd make it to the back row. Keep passing them forwards if you can. We still have some live trains. We've got a live train here. Do we have a live train over there? Yeah? Okay, let's do one more row. So people in this row, turn around, and if they're still standing up, pass on your cards. Okay, I think we'll probably stop there, but now can the people who've had a card stay standing and the people who never got one sit down? So if you didn't get a card, sit down, if you actually managed to reach you. And look, we've got this crazy graph-like shape that's come through here. We have some big clusters, some small clusters, some almost isolated people, and I think if we'd had enough cards, we might have made it through to the back of the room, or we might have not. What I want you to remember from this is that the eventual pattern that comes out is incredibly complicated, I gave you all a two-thirds probability of standing up, and those of you that started out standing, almost all of you stayed standing by the end of it. So you don't need too many people standing to get this percolation trick working. Thank you very much. You can all sit down there. Let me tell you a bit more about the maths. So remember that big, messy shape, right? Big, messy shape, but we did keep making it through the rows. So applications. I've shown you one application, which was a bit of a toy example, my orchard, orchard problem. Spread of wildfires is a really serious application. So forest fires, for example. You've got a chance of fire jumping from one patch of woodland to another. The probability that it can make that jump depends on how close the patches of woodland are. And it's a very serious problem for countries like Australia to try and ensure that fires aren't going to spread. They need to know how much they should thin their forests and maintain gaps between things if they don't want fire to jump all the way through. Spread of human disease. So we could make a graph where it's everybody that you meet while you're infectious with flu or even worse, SARS or Ebola or something like that. And then there would be a probability with each person you met of you passing on the disease. If the government's trying to decide how much flu medication it needs to get in to prevent epidemics, A, they're going to panic and buy too much, but B, they really, really need to know how this disease is going to percolate through the human population. We're mathematicians. We like the infinite. Let's think about what happens with an infinite version. So infinitely many vertices arranged in a grid, say a square grid. The system percolates if after putting in the edges with fixed probability, we could do it with the vertices, but let's go back to edges like on my first apple tree example. Infinitely many vertices are all joined together. Okay, so there might be infinitely many joined together, there might not be. It's gonna, we say that it percolates if we do get infinitely many all joined together. So if I had an infinite orchard, I would have a certain probability for each tree passing on blight to its neighbours. And you might well think that the probability that I get an infinite set of infected trees would look a lot like this. So here the bottom axis is the probability increasing. This is planting the trees closer and closer together, infinitely many of them. And this is the chance of there being an infinite set of infected trees. So again, not all the trees, but infinitely many of them, half of them maybe, infinitely many of them. But in fact, that doesn't happen. In fact, the probability of an infinite set of infected trees jumps like this. It's not, 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 not. You're not going to get an infected set, infinite set, not going to get an infinite set, not going to get an infinite set, definitely are going to get an infinite set. It jumps. And it jumps because of a result, well, not because, but we know it jumps because of a result by the Russian mathematician Andrei Kolmogorov, who said that whenever you have some infinite sequence of probability things, like edges being there or not there between the trees, and some event which is independent of any finite set of them. So if I have an infinite set of infected trees and I remove finitely many edges, I'll break it up, but there'll still always be at least one infinite set. If I break it squarely in half, I've now got two infinite sets. If I break it near the edge, I've got a little finite bit and some infinite sets. But if I remove just finitely many things, I'll still have an infinite set. So his um, result says that it always jumps like that. So you can see that the point where it jumps, I've drawn it at a half, but we've and that's called the critical probability, the second appearance of the word critical in this talk, the point where the probability of an infinite set jumps from zero to one. 
Well, for our infinite grid of trees, Ted Harris proved in 1960 that the critical probability was at most a half. 20 years later, Harry Keston managed to prove that the critical probability is exactly a half. So if I have an infinite orchard, if I have less than probability a half of the trees passing on disease to their neighbours, I won't get an infinite set of infected trees. More than a half, I definitely will. At a half, which was one of our experiments, something very messy happens. We'd love to know more about what happens at these very messy points when you're exactly on the critical probability. We saw that there were big clusters, small clusters, all sorts of things were going on. Well, lots of people have thought about this. So, Vendelin Werner, there he is, and Stan Smirnov, there he is, both won Fields medals, there one is, for their work on percolation theory. Um, Vendelin Werner uh, was looking at what happens at exactly these critical probabilities. So, this is a phenomenon you experience in physics as well, phase transitions. There's a particular temperature where a liquid will turn into a gas. It doesn't go smoothly into a gas. Once bits hit that temperature, they go into gas. So there, there's a critical threshold. So there's all sorts of physical applications to this. And he was looking about the behavior at that phase transition critical probability and was able to show that the shapes you get are exactly, of clusters, like we saw, are exactly what you would get if you could work out how to cut entirely at random in a sheet of paper. That's a shape out. Okay. Once you've worked out how on earth to mathematize that statement, which you can if you're Vendelin Werner and about to get a Fields medal, then you can show that the shapes that are going to come out are the same shapes as we get at these critical probabilities playing percolation games. Interesting fact about Vendelin Werner, he's been in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> he's been in a French movie. He has a bacon number, a, a, nerd off, a bacon number of three. He's also a mathematician. And as far as I can tell, his Erdos number is also three, which means here is the second person in my talk with an Erdos Bacon number of six. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there you go. All right, let me finish with one final fairly swift application, just showing you how far percolation theory can go. So this is not about graphs now, this is about the real world. And the question is, why do the galaxies look like they do? So, there's a picture of a galaxy. What have we got? We've got a central clump, we've got these spiral arms, We've got the dark streaks between them, and then we've got various lumps and bumps outside. Why do they look like that? What makes them that shape? Well, one answer. There's a, this is a single paper I found that was quite cute. I'm not claiming this is the uh, biggest current theory for why they look like they do, but it's certainly one of them out there. Each bit of a galaxy, well, it's got some stars in it, and it's also got some just sort of deadish regions of gas. Now, the thing about those regions of gas is that they are, in some sense, future stars. <laughs> if they start clumping together, then gravity keeps pulling them closer and closer and closer, and eventually they get squished up enough that they ignite and they form a star. So that's what the galaxy looks like. We've got some stars and some bits of gas. Something needs to happen to make those bits of gas clap. What could that be? Supernova. So, star could explode. When it explodes, it sends a shockwave, boom, massive explosion. Shockwave right through space. So, you know, you've all seen pictures in Hollywood movies of things exploding. Shockwaves come out. That shockwave going through space is enough that it can make these regions of gas that are just floating around being a bit bimbly <laughs> do the collapsing and forming stars thing. Many years later, a small proportion of those stars are going to go nova in their turn. So they too are going to hit the big boom button. Not all of them will, some of them will. And when that happens, what do we have? Well, over eons of time and vast distances of space, we have galactic percolation. This is an experiment that these two guys did, science article. So they modeled the galaxies rotating, but then they modeled percolating supernova through vast distances of time. And this is the eventual picture they came out with. And I think you'll probably all agree that it doesn't look exactly like that picture, but it's not too far wrong for a model of maybe why galaxies look like they do. So I'll just finish with a thought that uh, if our bit of the galaxy hadn't had enough matter in it to be over that critical percolation threshold, then our star would never have been formed because it wouldn't have had a nova near enough and we all wouldn't be. So we should be pleased that we're living in a supercritical world. Right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much.
blowing wonderful talk. Thank you so much, Conga. Uh, are there any questions? There's a lot to take in. It's hard, but does anyone have any questions that they want to ask Conga? Apple farming related, <laughs> galaxy related, <laughs> party related. Can you, oh. can you say briefly why they haven't been able to figure out the um, Ramsey number for the case five? Because the number of possible... So, to prove that it's greater than some number, you have to do like what I did with five. You actually have to come up with an example of a graph where you haven't got the vertices connected together correctly. Um, and by the time you're looking at, say, 43 vertices all connected together, there's an awful lot of edges there. That's 43 choose two edges, so <coughs> we're all about 1,600 so off. And then there's two to the four, there's two to that many possibilities for co coloring them. It's just too big. So the ways in which Erdosh was able to prove his bands were using probability theory, actually. He was able to use cunning probability theory methods and get that things happen with probability naught or probability one, which means you can say they definitely happen or don't happen. But those aren't tight enough to pin down the actual number, and it's just too big. The person who conjectured that it is actually 43, Brendan Mackay, um, is probably the best person in the world at solving large problems of this sort on a computer, and it's too much even for him. Any further questions? Let me just first of all then just remind you, Plus Magazine and In Our Time, the website, I'm sure that all of you want to go hear more from Colva. She's such a brilliant speaker. So can we just say thank you so much, Colva.